Our keynote speaker this evening is Eliza Griswold, a very, very interesting person. She's the winner of the 2010 Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome. And she's a former Neiman Fellow, a journalist at Harvard University, who reports on religion, conflict, and human rights. Ms. Griswold has won awards for both her nonfiction work and for her poetry. She is currently a fellow at the New America Foundation. Her nonfiction work and poetry have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, New York Times Magazine. In 2007, she published a book of poetry titled Wide Awake Field that met with excellent reviews, including from Robert Pinsky, the former US Poet Laureate. Her latest book is The Tenth Parallel, just published. It's an examination of Christianity and Islam in Africa and Asia and that, too, has received rave reviews. Ms. Griswold earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton and went on to study creative writing at Johns Hopkins. She won the very first Robert Friedman Prize in Investigative Journalism 2004 for In the Hiding Zone, a report about tribes in the northwest region of Pakistan. Now, please join me in welcoming author and poet Eliza Griswold. Thank you so much. I, I wish I could be there with you this evening. I, I feel a little bit, it, a li, it's a little bit naughty to say, but I would so much rather be in Denver than in Western Pennsylvania, uh, which is a beautiful place, but a very, very desolate place. So clearly these days we have all been closely following the news. I was in Libya last year uh, interviewing Saif al-Islam al-Qaddafi Muammar Gaddafi's son, and who was at the time heir apparent to, let's just call it the throne in Libya. And he was to be the reformer. He was making the right noises about human rights. And to see what he's done recently, and that he called for rivers of blood against his own people, has been so appalling and upsetting. You know, it's quite a departure from what we had seen at least on the surface in Libya. And my heart goes out tonight to both the Libyans as well as to the Japanese and to so many others across Egypt, across Bahrain, across Tunisia. We really are at the beginning of, of a new tide of revolution. So what does that revolution mean? Largely we're seeing, although Iran has said differently, we're seeing not at all an Islamic awakening. We're seeing largely secular revolutions with the greatest divisions being between young and old, not religious and secular. And definitely among the young people, the call to technology, the call to leave Palestine alone, to look at what their own problems are, new leadership is, is definitely quite large. So what we're seeing with these revolutions looks largely secular. And, and this evening, I'm gonna step back a bit because the answer is that we don't know what's going to happen. In many, many places, the longest forms of opposition, certainly in Libya, certainly in Egypt, are religious in nature. They're the most organized groups. Uh, they, they've been around for a very long time. And although in the throes of revolution, what we're seeing, we don't see a lot of calls to religious reawakening the, the jury is out. We'll have to see what happens as societies reform themselves and decide what those values they'll reform themselves are going to be along. So this evening I thought I'd back up a bit and talk a little bit about the questions of Christianity and Islam and just frame what's going on in the world today a bit better. As most of us know, four out of five of the world's 1.6 billion Muslims do not live in the Middle East. They live in Africa, they live in Libya, and they live in Egypt, and, and they live in Asia. And so I wanted to travel in the course of the past seven years along the fault line where Islam meets with nearly half the world's two billion Christians. And I wanted to travel along this fault line, this religious faith-based fault line, to see what happens on the ground in floods, in droughts, in elections, when these two religions actually meet. So for various reasons of geography and for centuries of human migration, as well as arbitrary lines drawn by colonial administrators on maps, 
Christianity and Islam largely meet between the equator and the line of latitude 700 miles to the north of it, the 10th parallel. So in this roughly 1,000 thousand mile wide band uh, from West Africa through Southeast Asia, about half the world's Muslims and half the world's Christians come into contact. And so I wanted to see beyond this oversimplified and overblown narrative of the clash of civilizations, I wanted to see what actually happens on the ground. And what I found over seven years of traveling again and again to Nigeria, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines is that every conflict that called itself religious in nature had some kind of worldly or secular trigger. Every time politics, race, many complex cultural factors came to bear, economics essentially, these are, these are fights over power that take on the colors of religion in, in almost every case. Certainly what surprised me to learn in Indonesia, in the eastern part of the archipelago, is that one of the things Christians and Muslims have fought over when bloodshed has been really bad between them, it's been when the global price of chocolate, cacao, the principal ingredient in chocolate, when that price spikes, so too has violence between Christians and Muslims because the land becomes more valuable and the two are essentially fighting a land war. Now the patterns of how these, these civilizations have come to meet one another is quite interesting. In Africa, this is where the northern third of dry Africa meets the wetter, denser sub-Saharan south. And where the weather changes, Islam stops and Christianity begins. Traditionally, as in Sudan, which, which the word means, Sudan means black, and the traditional name for Sudan was Balada Sudan. And that spoke to the beginning of what was called the land of the blacks, where the Arab world ended and the, the sub-Saharan world began, the black African world began. Traditionally, this was a land where slave raiding began and s slave raiding the trade for gold and for ivory. And so traditionally Arab societies and, and Muslim slave raiders would travel south to this, to this zone, this band along the 10th parallel. And for those reasons, which certainly predate the arrival of Christianity in many cases, Although any good African Christian will tell you that Christianity has been in Africa since 37 AD, since four years after the death of Jesus, according to the Bible, that, that date marks the conversion of the first Ethiopian eunuch uh, who actually came from what is today Sudan uh, to Christianity. But largely what's happened is where, where this belt of non-Muslims used to meet Islam now many of those non-Muslims have converted to Christianity. And so Christianity has become an ideological backbone to oppose what many have seen as a centuries old competition and conflict with Islam. So this is what's, when we see what's happening in Nigeria, fights over land, over the right to be a citizen in Nigeria. I mean, most Nigerians live on less than $2 a day. They don't have the rights to basic services, including electricity, clean water, education, scholarship. And so religious identity comes in to safeguard their rights to clean water. It's the local imam, the local Muslim leader, or the local Christian leader, the local priest, who can safeguard a community's rights to getting clean water. And for that reason, since the state has failed to meet the needs of its people, religion comes in as a local identity and a global one. For instance, we'll take Nigeria for just for an example to understand how global identities go local. In one town called Kaduna, which means crocodile, along the 10th parallel, which is almost evenly split between Christians and Muslims, the communities are divided by a river called crocodile, called Kaduna. And on the Muslim side of the river, the neighborhoods are called Baghdad, Afghanistan, to show global unity between believers in Nigeria, African Muslims, and those who are embattled farther away. The, the Christian neighborhoods are called Haifa, Jerusalem, and inexplicably television. I've, I've never quite understood that one. And, and, and a, a Jewish friend you recently asked me, well, does, do you think they mean Tel Aviv? And I said, well, I don't know because they don't know. But so you see how you have local actors, local identity with this global characterization. And I would say more than any other 
form of identity in the world today, the world is breaking down along tribal lines. So we see that we see that places where countries were arbitrary and states were weak from the beginning, other forms of identity have come to the fore beyond any of the other kinds. Religion is the common denominator. So that is what I've seen over seven years of traveling. And certainly I've watched two sides shape each other because as we have religious awakenings on one side in the Christian world that tend to be conservative, they tend to aff affirm traditional moral values at traditional forms of reading literal scripture, we have their equal members on the Muslim side. For instance, one of the former, foremost Muslim organizations in Egypt, and certainly the most powerful one today, is the Muslim Brotherhood. Its precursor came out of an organization called the Young Men's Muslim Association, the YMMA. The YMMA was formed directly in competition with the presence of Christian missionaries in Egypt. And who did those missionaries work with? They worked with the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. So the Muslims who lived in Egypt, seeing, seeing a Christian organization that came in and taught health hygiene in the Bible, got together and said, well, we can do the same thing. We're going to teach health hygiene and the Quran. Now, how, does, how do we go from this earliest 20th century to today? Well, we certainly see the Muslim Brotherhood in today's Egypt. And again, we're waiting to see we're waiting to see what's going to shake out there. But the Muslim Brotherhood is really the strongest social entity, not because they espouse Islam necessarily, but because they address the most basic needs of their people. They feed people. They help provide education and social services that the Egyptian government has not. And so, again, we see where poverty and religion come to bear as a source of power for people as a source of identity when the state fails to meet the needs of its people. And with, with these failing states, with unpopular governments and leaders being overthrown, we, we wait to see, and, and we wait with great hopes, you know, despite the bloodshed, despite some of the horrific, horrific reactions regimes have had and are having right now in the world, we do wait with hope to see what, what shape societies are gonna take. But in order to understand this book a little bit better, I thought I would read you a brief passage because I understood pretty early on that all these objective, these so-called objective truths about clash of civilizations, these huge narratives of tectonic plates of religion moving, on the ground they broke down into very human relationships. And the first human relationship I need to address is, is my own subjective lens. There was no objective truth about whether people believed in God or whether they were simply gunning for political economy. Again, I listened to people tell me about what, what they believed God to be, how they saw their lives as patterned by, by the divine every day. And so my job in this book was to bring that back, to bring that back really whole cloth as a collection of stories. And the first story to understand it is how I came into this. Now, I first traveled to Sudan in 2003 with Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, head of a half billion dollar evangelical empire. And Franklin was going to meet with a man who's been very much in the news these days. And this man is President Omar Hassan al-Bashir, the, the current president of Sudan. And, you know, now at this point when I was there, he had just, he had, there was a very dirty little secret on his tongue. And that was what was going on in Darfur. But nobody was really talking about it yet. It was hushed, hushed rumors around Khartoum, around the capital. And he had not yet been indicted, but now he has been indicted for crimes of genocide um, and crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. He's still the sitting president of northern Sudan today. So Franklin Graham was best known at the time, not only for being Billy Graham's son, but he had recently called, in the shadow of 9-11, he had called Islam a very wicked and evil religion. And this was a matter of sound bites. It was rocketing around the Islamic world. And Northern Sudan, being predominantly Muslim, was not very much looking forward to Franklin Graham's visit. And there had been some protests about his coming, but it was very much in the interest of President Bashir to show that he was friendly to an American regime to, to make sure that he and his regime would not become the next Muslim country on the American hit list. And so Franklin Graham had called, he had called Bashir uh, 
just as evil as Saddam Hussein, if not more so. And Bashir had no love for Franklin Graham. And the two men sat down, and I, I got to sit down with them as this curious witness to history. And each tried to convert the other to his respective faith, and that did not go over terribly well. And so what happened next is that Franklin reached into his pocket and pulled out a George W. Bush 2004 re-election pin. And he said to President Bashir, uh, Mr. President, I understand you'll be speaking to my president later today. Why don't you tell him you're his first voter here in the Sudan? Now, where we are in history today, it's very difficult to imagine that happening, that, that a man who's been indicted for war crimes would be having a call with, with the American president. But that's the, that was the state of affairs in 2003. And the question is, what does that mean? Very clearly, that meant that there was, there was an alliance that, that Franklin Graham was, although he called himself the ambassador to Jesus Christ, he was also in a de facto way, in an informal way, a representative of the U.S. government, at least in Bashir's eyes, because that's why it was important for Bashir to curry favor with the Bush regime. I was interested in this visit so much because it represented the link between faith and foreign policy, that we have watched emerging both real and perceived among the world's Muslims for the past decade, really since 9-11. These suspicions about what is the American agenda, largely based on the fact that until very recently, just as I told that story of the, the YMCA and the YMMA, there was no such thing as secular human rights work. There was no such thing as secular aid. All aid was done in the world on behalf of Christian, by Christian missionaries. And so, the deep suspicions we're seeing today predate the invasions, the highly unpopular invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. They are, they are decades old, and they are deep, and they are abiding. And what we're seeing now is a younger generation that's actually willing in Egypt and in Libya to engage with the West that isn't so suspicious, that doesn't have this legacy of, of the so-called Christian West, a, a more technologically savvy generation. And I've got, I've got great hopes for them. So I will read you now, because after that encounter between Bashir and Graham, we went back to the government guest house where Bashir, where, excuse me, where Graham was staying. And there was a prayer meeting, and I was there on behalf of that extraordinarily religious uh, magazine, Vanity Fair magazine. And I was standing in a prayer circle and doing my reporting, and we were invited to pray, and I lowered my head without thinking about it, partly because of who I am. So I'm just going to read briefly to, to you about what happened next, and then, then I think we're going to open it up for some questions. I'll have some brief remarks. So in the hallway, a few minutes after the prayer meeting, Ken Isaacs, Graham's second-in-command, a tall, hard-jawed North Carolinian who would go on to head the office of U.S foreign disaster assistance as under President Bush approached me and asked, what's your background? Originally, I came from Philadelphia, I told him. That's not what I meant, he said. Was I a believer or not? Salvation was absolute, saved or damned. There was no in-between. Which was I? To me, the question required a more complex answer. I was raised as the daughter of an Episcopal priest, and I grew up in a rectory in suburban Philadelphia during the 70s and 80s a particularly progressive moment for the church. Worship included Passover seders, Jesus Christ superstar, and doing the crop hunger walk, as well as gathering around an altar and eating home homemade organic wheat bread as the Eucharist. This was the bustling, clamorous world of public religion. Talking and listening to God involved a quiet conversation, and words, I was sure, were the way to reach his ear. For me as a six-year-old girl, going out to play often meant sneaking next door to the dark, cool church. I learned to read by standing at the pulpit and practicing the Bible's cadences out over the empty pews. I saw the Bible sitting open on the brass lectern, a red satin ribbon marking the page as a book of spells, one whose extravagant metaphors, whose terrible and powerful parables were ways to call God down to earth. In college, 15 years later, I read the work of the 20th century Romanian historian and theologian Marcia Eliade. When I came across his concept of hierophany, the spaces where the sacred and secular worlds meet, and people's attempt to create them through ceremony, I understood what I had been up to as a child. At Sunday school, a boy my age, 
once asked me if my father was God. No, he's God's best friend, I replied. I saw my loving, distant, distractible father caught between two worlds. One was a place of worldly decisions and unexpected telephone calls. Once I watched him rip the rectory's black rotary phone right off the wall. The other was a sacred realm in which he was a servant, not a leader. When I was 12, he was elected the Episcopal Bishop of Chicago. And so we moved from a Philadelphia suburb to the urban shore of Lake Michigan. At his consecration, the rite in which a person formally offers himself or herself to God as a bishop, my father, following long tradition, lay face down on the cathedral floor with his legs extended and his arms outstretched, his body forming the shape of a cross. There was something about this act of utter surrender that terrified and angered me. What right had God and the several thousand Midwestern strangers in the pews to demand my father's life? When are they going to let dad up, I asked my mother. Although I feared for my father, I also feared for myself. What did God want from us anyway? As a teenager, I grew petrified of God's will. What if he were to swoop down and ask me to submit also? What could faith cost me? It could cost me my life, I concluded. So frankly, I was afraid God would ask me to be a nun. That was a big joke in our family, and it's a little disembodied not to be with you there because typically people laugh and they know me a little bit better, but, but I can't hear if you're laughing here. My father's uncompromising uncom commitment to the articles of his faith proved difficult for me to reconcile with his progressive values and his critical intelligence. I spent those years wondering how it was that smart people, intelligent people, could reconcile faith with their intellect. When I traveled with Franklin Graham to Sudan 16 years later, my father was serving as the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. The consecration of Judith B. Robinson, an open homosexual, had just taken place, upsetting not only African bishops, but also conservative American evangelicals such as Graham. This was evidence to them of the lethal moral lassitude of the West. For Graham, the contemporary confrontation with Islam was sharpening the Christian faith giving it moral fortitude. Western sinfulness and moral slackness were weakening the faith worldwide, and Christianity needed the faith West to shape up if it was going to win the fight. But for Graham, as for others, the consecration of Jean Robinson as the Bishop of New Hampshire was not just a sign of weakness, of falling away from the old true faith. It was a full-on repudiation of the sexual morality that some believe set them apart from others. As such, it marked a divide among Protestants the worldwide over what it meant to be a Christian, over whether progressives or conservatives had the right to speak in the name of God. The Reverend Franklin Graham and presiding Bishop Griswold stood on opposite sides of this divide, and the gap between them was widening, and I was the presiding bishop's daughter. You have 30 seconds to tell Franklin that, Ken Isaac said. Graham was in the dining room eating a lunch of oxtail soup with 12 members of his entourage. In the doorway, I hesitated. 13 seconds, Isaac said, standing behind me. I sat down at the table and told Graham who my father was. Graham listened, then looked at me and flashed a smile. Not the familiar high white public beam, but a private and mischievous grin. He and I were kin. For although we were raised with very different understandings of what it meant to be a Christian, we were also fellow people were preacher's kids, modeled sheep who had grown up caught between religious parents and private rebellion. But that's where our similarity ended. As far as he was concerned, the fact that I had not accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior meant I was going to hell. There is no middle ground. Salvation is black and white, God told me. He had made this choice for Christ. Why hadn't I? I asked him to clarify. The clatter of soup spoon speaks ceased. Graham looked at me and said, Jesus is the only one who died for our sins. Muhammad didn't do that. Buddha died still searching for truth. He quoted what I later learned was the gospel according to John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There was one and only one way to be saved and to be assured a place in heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. If your plane crashes tomorrow, he asked me, are you absolutely sure you'll go to heaven? I thought for a moment. No. Would you be willing to pray with me now, he asked.
I'm going to stop reading there. So that really marks the beginning of a seven-year journey along this encounter between Christianity and Islam. People ask me all the time what the one deciding factor was, and I think my answer may be maddening, but it is more true than any other. The most important and overlooked religious clashes, religious struggles of our time are not those between Christianity and Islam. They are those within Christianity and Islam. They are the struggles between liberals and conservatives, different sectarian groups within Islam, Sunnis, Shias, liberals, conservatives, over who has the right to speak for God and why. We see this play out on our streets, on the steps of the Washington Memorial, on the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, all the time. And these are the most overlooked clashes of our time. So that is my hope for those reading this book and in really going with me on this journey to this curious fault line where Christianity and Islam meet that we take away a deeper understanding of ourselves, of, of what divides us, of the challenges that divide us, and, and how we are to bridge those divides foremost between Christians and Christians. Then we reach out to Muslims and Muslims. It, it, we let those divisions lie within every religion. They absolutely determine the future of our faith. They determine the future of our politics too, and it's time for us to address them. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Eliza, for the remarks, and really congratulations on, on your wonderful book. It's, uh, it's really refreshing. As I was hearing your uh, presentation today, it, it actually brought back a lot of childhood memories for me, because I think the one thing uh, that we share is that uh, my father, too, was a minister. He was a Southern Baptist minister, and I certainly remember that deep fear uh, that I had of the Reverend T.S. Bohm, the pastor of the Hill Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia, uh, who baptized me. Um, but uh, the, the uh, experience of growing up um, in, uh, as the child of a, 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 of a pastor, um, I wonder if there's something that gets one into journalism and then gets one into international studies, certainly the same pathway that I found. So uh, really, it, it did bring back a lot of very uh, important uh, and, and really stark memories. So, um, well, we have a number of questions from our community, and uh, I, I thought I would uh, just uh, work through a few of them here. But there's one question that I have. Um, uh, that's based on some, uh, some research that I've done together with some colleagues here at the University of Denver as well as uh, broadly, which is on the, on the curious role of religious leaders. You know, at, at, after 9-11, uh, and, and particularly after 7-7 in the, in the United Kingdom, one of the moves uh, taken by governments was to expel religious leaders who, um, and particularly imams who had been involved with incitement to violence. So we see this as a sort of a, um, a common a reaction to the role of religious leaders uh, in these contexts. But at the same time, uh, for example, that you mentioned in Nigeria and your work in Kaduna, we had these models of religious leaders, the very uh, uh, a kind of popular uh, imam and pastor who got together, uh, they made a film, they went on a book tour. How do we interpret this, this sort of uh, question about religious leaders at times? We see them sort of even going so far as to incite differences among communities, whereas other times they serve as mediators. In your travels, you must have seen these different types of religious leaders. And, and the question is sort of, well, what do we make of this? Now, that's an excellent question, Tim. I mean, what, I'm, what I would say I've seen as a heartening sign about the U.S. response to the, the world at the moment is, you know, the State Department is just starting to reach out now. It has a new initiative to reach out to non-governmental organizations. And among them will certainly be faith-based groups. Um, and that, in places like Nigeria and Sudan, certainly, that's essential because in places where government titles mean nothing, you know, I mean, in Nigeria, the government embezzles between four and eight billion dollars in a single year, that's a human rights watch statistic, uh, from their own people. That's oil wealth, right? So who comes in to fill the gap? In good ways and bad ways, religious leaders come, come to fill that role. You mentioned Pastor James Wue and Imam Narayan Ashafa, two dear friends who I met in the course of reporting this book 
these guys they they live and work primarily in the town of Kaduna. They are they are extraordinarily slick and ready for prime time far more than I am, I have to say. Um, they are also self-avowed fundamentalists. Each believes the other is going to hell in no uncertain terms unless he converts to the other's respective faith. These two men were blood enemies to the level at which the, the pastor has one arm. That's because the imam's boys uh, lopped off the pastor's other arm in fighting over a market. Again, a secular trigger, always a secular trigger uh, many years ago. And the, the two were heads of rival armies. And, you know, the pastor told me that until quite recently, when the two would travel together on peace missions, because they do travel quite frequently abroad, because of that loss of his arm, he considered they'd, you know, they'd share a hotel room. He considered smothering the imam with a pillow in the night. Uh, because of the level of rage he has at the physical loss of his arm, but he never has. Why? Well, certainly because of his relationship with God. I mean, that's foremost. Also because these two men have come to understand that even though they do not believe and will not compromise on the basic tenets of their respective faith, they are exclusive believers in their way, they understand that it's simply impossible for their society to exist. There's too much destruction. There's been they've too much loss of life, cattle, land, houses, everything. And so in order to survive, they're going to have to find a way to tolerate each other. Now, tolerance is a word that, as we certainly know, is for liberals, oh, tolerance, let's just practice tolerance. But for conservatives, the word tolerance is smacks of mealy mouth relativism in a way they're very uncomfortable with. So I would say, leave the word tolerance behind and simply let's see how it is that religious leaders operate in their communities. It's pretty clear quite, I mean, I would say in my work, which has taken me, you know, I mean, in Indonesia, I spent the bulk of my time with a, a man who's worked for Al Qaeda for most of his adult life, uh, you know, trained in Afghanistan, came back and was a point man um, for Jama Islamia, which is the Al Qaeda link group, one of them now, because the groups have splintered in Indonesia. And it's pretty clear with when working with partners, you know, who is legitimate and who's not when we visit them on their own home turf. And that's, of course, that's not universally true. And the U.S. has seen that in our, our own work with the Muslim Brotherhood, right? I mean, the international wing of the Muslim Brotherhood has a very different agenda than, than the domestic wing of the Muslim Brotherhood does in Egypt. And so it's tricky business. It's essential business to addressing today's foreign policy needs. We, we need to reach out to non-government leaders and religious leaders in particular. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Your mentioning of this issue of tolerance, you know, we've, we've seen different notions of tolerance as well. Tolerance is, is kind of a minimal condition. You simply tolerate the other versus a, something that uh, my colleague David Little, maybe as many, many in the audience have read David's work on religion and human rights. Maybe uh, oh, you've yeah. uh, run across David, uh, uh, one of my uh, former uh, bosses in this world, so it's a close friend. But he talks about uh, tolerance too, uh, like tolerance one being minimal, tolerance two being where um, instead of just simply tolerating the other, it's sort of an embracing of the nature of coexistence. And, and uh, I think that may be a, an, a, an interesting kind of thing to think about is what does tolerance mean in these environments? Well, of course, sure. we I mean, I would say, you know, one of the things that I've certainly seen is and this, you know, as you'll understand as a fellow PK is dicey ground, but a majority of the interfaith work being done today is is not terribly effective because one of the it's too much about finding shared ideological ground well in fact our time is much better spent finding practical solutions to basic development needs and keeping our beliefs as to what they are i mean the pastor and the imam are so successful because they've addressed the most basic needs of garbage collection buying stoves because one of the things christians and muslims fight over most in nigeria is firewood you know this is a largely deforested very dry area and Christians and Muslims come to blow over who's going to get the firewood. Well, what they've done in this very basic kind of Obama-esque community building, you know, basic societal development, is buy stoves for women and say, listen, you can have this stove. You've got to pay me back. 
Nigerian women pay more than a dollar a day to collect firewood or buy it. Um, this stove costs $200 as opposed to $365. You, Christian woman, you, Muslim woman, come together, figure out how you're going to pay for this. So just those kind of practical solutions tend to be much more viable and much more successful. Very good. Uh, one of the questions that comes uh, uh, from our community is actually on the role of um, the labeling of these kinds of conflicts. And I couldn't agree with you more often when one sort of scratches uh, not too far below the surface. You see the underlying drivers are around resources or a citizenship, as you mentioned, uh, in the case of Nigeria. But what responsibility or role do journalists play in trying to squeeze you know, into a 500-word story uh, something about a conflict like uh, in Jos uh, in Nigeria or even Sudan um, to call these religious conflicts uh, or Christian Muslim conflicts. How does a journalist uh, like uh, yourself or, or others, what, what sort of role do they play? What are the ethical aspects of, of uh, how these conflicts are described? Well, unfortunately, you know, here's where it gets tricky. The, the, the person who's tasked with doing a 500 word wire service story on a conflict, a Nigerian conflict in the middle belt capital of Jos, I, I feel great compassion for, because that's extraordinarily difficult. Um, you can't get it right. I mean, these are, these are, these are, as I said, if you want to tell that story right, you begin before Christianity be arrived, because essentially these, these divisions date back to ethnic. Nope, even to call them ethnic would be too simple. They, they date back to when these, these d disparate groups of non-Muslims fled to this belt and took high ground in order to protect themselves from slave raiding that was primarily carried out by Muslims, right? And they were they were enslaved because they were non-Muslims. That and it was it was possible and okay to enslave them under Islamic law. I will point out that the Bible says much the same thing. So we you know just being careful with with our scripture here. So, okay, so if you want to frame that story right and you don't start with that history, you've already missed most of it, right? Because that's where these deep-seated tensions actually begin. Um, the other, you know, the ethical question about is actually an interesting one because I have been tasked many, many times on the other side of trying to, by, you know, being sent out by a secular news organization to look at the question of political economy in, in a situation in which religion is discounted, right? So what do you make of the pastor and the imam who will tell you right away, this is a conflict with many complex causes. One of them is religion. Well, do you say, I know better than you do? It's not about religion. That would be, that would be a kind of cultural imperialism. So I certainly found consistently in my work, which is why I said about bringing people's stories back whole cloth, that it was my job to report accurately what people told me and to make sure that I was seeking out enough different viewpoints. Now, of course, I had the space to do that and the time to do that, you know, uh, which is a little bit different. Um, but it's frequently what I would say about that is it's frequently the actors themselves who are quite eager to cast a, a religion in, in a conflict in terms of religion. And then it's our job to represent that voice, not think we know better than that voice, uh, but certainly include disparate viewpoints as well. Yeah, very good. I've done a lot of work on the Northern Ireland conflict, and one of the things I've always tried to avoid is description of it in the classic uh, in the sort of Catholic uh, Protestant terms. But then more recently uh, in a book project, I had a, a colleague from Northern Ireland, very well-known uh, professor at Brandeis University, and she really wrote about how the uh, protagonists themselves describe it in religious right. terms and describe it as a religious uh, conflict. Uh, so it, it is a, um, an important approach. Uh, uh, we had a question that came in and I, I wanted to, it, it's a little bit out of the 10th parallel. In fact, I think it's quite a bit to the north, but I wanted to raise sure. it for you. Um, which sure. is, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we think about things uh, like in Switzerland where we had a popular referendum as they have pretty often in Switzerland 
and uh, the, the public voted to uh, ban further construction of minarets uh, in Swiss uh, cities. And uh, we're thinking about the fault lines of Christianity and, and Islam. I typically do think of the 10th parallel. We don't typically think of Zurich, uh, Lausanne, and, and these kind of places. Right. Um, so uh, it's, uh, and, and of course, we've seen uh, this in, uh, in the southern part of Manhattan as well, right around sure. uh, this. So your reflections on, on uh, not just the Swiss minaret ban, but the overall question of, of the intersection of these faiths uh, in, in North America, in Western Europe. Well, sure. I mean, one thing people have come up to me after, you know, hearing me speak and said, you know, the situation in Europe is quite different. And I would say the situation in Europe is different. The situation country by country is different because all of, you know, there, as, as I said, there's, you know, as there's no such single one thing as Christianity, there are many groups within Christianity, there's no such thing, single thing as Islam. There are many, many Islams. And so a lot of the situation country by country has to do with what groups, uh, what refugee groups have reached where, when. Now, one broad thing I would say is, and, and this is something I've heard quite frequently. So, okay, so one of the arguments that some some conservatives, like I think of a Nigerian archbishop, uh, Peter Akinola comes to mind per se, but you might, you would probably hear the same thing from American conservatives, which is what Islam did not do, and I, I am quoting here because this is not something that I, I would say is my own opinion, right? Um, what Islam, you know, didn't succeed by doing by the sword, they're doing by the ballot box and by marriage today, right? The idea being that you know, in a democracy where where every citizen has a vote, um, a, a Muslim who can marry four wives and all those wives have children, that that by sheer numbers, by dint of numbers, uh, we're facing you know a threat from this rival religion. That's certainly a very common conception. Um, you know, I would say it's I would say it's misunderstood. Uh, but even you know, in Nigeria, a, a, one of my the favorite characters in the book, a uh, Muslim human rights lawyer, Abdullahi Abdullahi, told me in one field when where the Christians had come to fight with Muslims, they, they had been lined up because this is how they voted. And this is why this is so extraordinarily visually helpful for me to be in some of these battlegrounds. The Christians and Muslims had lined up behind their respective candidate. And again, okay, I'm saying Christians and Muslims, that's how they qualify themselves in this religion. You could look at ethnicity, you could look at a host of different factors. And why did it matter what religion won the election? Because whoever won would have the right to basically control citizenship and to say who belonged to the land, okay? So, but it was Christians and Muslims who lined up on either side of a field and they started to fight. And in saying, and both of them to this day, this was many years ago, both of them to this day fight about who had more people in the field that day. Like, the, and they'll just say, we had more, we had more. And Abdullahi Abdullahi said to me, listen, I'm a Muslim. I have four wives. They each have four children. You want to tell me numerically the Christians will win? They will not. I can see to it myself. And yeah, I just found that to be a very interesting moment. Yeah, very good. And poignant remarks, too, as we look ahead uh, in Nigeria to the elections in April, which, um, you know, uh, elections in Nigeria are typically accompanied by widespread uh, election related violence. And there uh, this is a, a real concern in this upcoming election because the the ways in which they've rotated north south presidents to try to mitigate this uh, divide. So. Very interesting stuff. Well, one of the questions that uh, a member of our community had, I think is, is really important and we've got to put, put out here, which is yeah. a re recently, um, uh, about two years ago, a couple of yeah. uh, scholars from Harvard University, Pippa Norris and Ron Englehart, they do these surveys around the world of values. It's called the World Values mm -hmm. Survey. And the, okay. the, the lead finding was that the big difference between the West and the Muslim world, uh, in their view, was the perceptions of the role and treatment of women. Uh, mm -hmm. And th that this was the sort of distinguishing factor in all of the surveys that they found. It wasn't about democracy, it wasn't mm -hmm. about human rights, it was about the role right. of women in society. So I wondered about your perceptions on, on um, sure. 
on that kind of hypothesis about the, the sure. these issues? So, so one of the questions, yeah, I think that's an essential question, right? I mean, it's kind of like that pH paper we had in eighth grade, you know, dip right. it in and see what what's the true reading that comes back on how open a society is, you know, the canary in the coal mine is, is treatment of women. So now, okay, so along, one thing I was very interested in learning, and one of the reason I chose these Muslim borderlands, right, this border between Christianity, the edge of Islam, was because I was interested to see if that, that, that fact, which I repeat again and again, that four out of five of the world's Muslims don't live in the Middle East, you know, at tiny Saudi Arabia, this, this understanding of this extraordinarily conservative Islam, how widespread is it? What happens in the world's largest Muslim country? Indonesia, you know? So what happens? Let's look at the treatment of women. Now, the treatment of women obviously differs country by country, at society by society. And again, you know, my what I think I've learned the most is not to draw to too broad generalizations. Um, but certainly, you know, in Indonesia and in Malaysia in particular, there are extraordinarily powerful Islamic women's groups. Most of the time, those women like Hillary Clinton have come into power either because their husbands, I mean, Hillary Clinton is a powerhouse of her own right, but her relationship to her husband certainly has a role in her own role now, um, as do you know both the daughters of or wives of former political leaders who are extraordinarily active as Muslim women. Um, I think in particular of a group called Sisters uh, Sisters in Islam in Malaysia. More interestingly, or just as interestingly, is is so there's a I'm sure his name is known to most people in your audience. Uh, the uh, progressive Islamic scholar Abdullah Hayanim at, at Emory uh, University, who says that this 10th parallel, I mean, he's particularly interested in this land in Indonesia, what happens along this Islamic world line, because he believes that the future of Islam is going to be far more progressive and driven not by this tiny uh, this tiny minority in in you know the so-called in the Arab world, but by these borderlands where there is a great deal more mixing with with other societies, there traditionally has been anyway. Um, things are a bit more open, so I guess the the verdict is out on that. You know, conservative Christian scholars will make exactly the same argument to to say why Christianity is getting more conservative because it's conservative at the borders as well. So again, I think we really have to watch the borders of of what's going on, certainly in terms of treatment of women uh, and across cultures and continents. You know, I mean, the, my journey was across nine thousand miles and you know two continents, ten countries to see what happens in different societies. Islam, it means so many things. And, and in most places outside of the traditional Middle East, women within Islam have a great deal more power. And so in that way, there, there's certainly a cultural element within Arab culture that, that is more regressive toward women than I would say Islam is by definition. Yeah, this um, makes me wonder if, if some of the um, really popular literature and very interesting books, uh, uh, like A Thousand Splendid Sons, for example, mm -hmm. maybe slightly mischaracterizes the broader Muslim world, and, and it's really more about, um, uh, about a certain uh, variant within Afghanistan as opposed to some sort of broader generalization. I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think it's very important to understand. I also will just, you know, to weigh in for a second, you know, one of my favorite places on earth, and unfortunately I can't go back there again, is Waziristan, uh, some of the tribal area between Pakistan and Afghanistan. I've been there quite a few times. And the first time I went, I was doing a story about women, right? So this is traditional, doesn't get more traditional than Pashtun, you know, borderland society, right? I mean, this is blood feud land. Um, and, you know, the Taliban come from the Pashtun people. So I was in this little village that was under the control of the Taliban at the time. And uh, and I was doing a story on women. And we were, it was hot. We were lying around on these beds. They're called char pies. And, and the women were just nattering to each other about this lady was, you know, this, how much this cost and this per family was doing this. And I was so bored. I thought I really, I, this is just gossip. Next time I'm going to do a story about men, right? 
So a couple of years later, I went back to Waziristan to do a story about a man. I profiled a man instead, and we went to the, you know, we went to the chalk, we went to the sort of local men's gathering place, and we ate a lot better because women eat the leftover food after men eat. Um, but besides that, the conversation was so much more boring. All they talked about was the cost of their guns, what the cartridges cost, and I realized then that the world, the women were negotiating social contracts. The women had the power, although no one, it, it would take that kind of lying around on beds for days and, and being deep, deep into the heart of it to see how power within, within Perda, within the sealed space of the family work, but those were the real decisions to be made, not, not who got to buy a new gun and who didn't. Very good. I'm glad you mentioned your experience in Waziristan. I sort of wanted to move to a couple of places sure. where you've done uh, um, research with uh, that in, in your writing that involves these extremist groups. It'd be the Somalia. Um, I, I noted uh, that you even met with members of the Idid uh, clan. Very interesting uh, stuff in Somalia, uh, as well as uh, in in the uh, South Asian context. Groups like the Taliban, uh, the Al Shabaab in Somalia, you know, from someone with your experience and on the ground sort of understanding of, of what makes these groups work, uh, should we be fighting them or should we be negotiating with them? Uh, this is one of the things that we see in the paper uh, that you know, U.S. military negotiating with the Taliban at the same time right. we know um, that uh, much is being put on the line in terms of the lives of, of U.S. soldiers. What do you make of the question of, of uh, engagement with these groups? Well, certainly, I mean, just to st stick on Somalia for a minute, because, I mean, Somalia being the world's longest running failed state and the most overlooked tragedy on the face of the planet. I mean, it's difficult to engage in Somalia emotionally or mentally because it's far away and so much else is going on. And, and we think, you know, Black Hawk Down, what do we really know about Somalia? You know. If they can't get their act together on them by themselves, what 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 are we doing there, right? Traditionally, that's been a lot of the understanding on of Somalia. And you mentioned Hussein Farah Idid, and you know one of the points of my book is that identity and religious identity is not fixed at all. It is changing all the time. And if Hussein Farah Idid is the son of a warlord, he's extremely devout now. He also used to be a U.S. Marine. So he's gone from U.S. Marine uh, living in California to, you know, devout, um, devout Sufi leader among his people. These things are fungible. You know, things change with time. So religious identity is very fungible. But, okay, in terms of engaging with al-Shabaab, we should, engaging him militarily with, okay, so al-Shabaab is the group that has emerged since 2006, since the United States tacitly backed neighboring Ethiopia to go into Somalia and overthrow a nascent Islamic government called the Islamic Courts Union. This government, the ICU as it was known, was pretty popular. Um, they were bringing, they were the first people to challenge the warlords in more than a decade. As a result of the Ethiopian invasion, the US support on that invasion, we created the very enemy we were seeking to destroy. Unfortunately, we there what began as a, a popular Islamic rebellion. Al Qaeda has long wanted a foothold in Somalia. Uh, some of the so most gallows humor reading. If you want to go on the Combating Terrorism uh, Center website, you can read letters from the 90s when Al Qaeda bin Laden was in um, nearby Sudan. And he sent a bunch of operatives, a small member, a number, less than a dozen, to Somalia to try to recruit the Somalis to, you know, Al Qaeda's cause. And the letters that these Al Qaeda operatives, known as Africa Corps, wrote back to to the sort of higher ups in Al Qaeda were like, "You you don't know these Somalis are so cheap, we can't recruit them. This one let his wife die rather than sell a cow. They don't want to be any part of us." So. Essentially, what Somalia serves as now is a very is a PR campaign for Al Qaeda. The idea that the U.S. is, you know, trying to enter the doorway to the Saudi Arabian to the Arabian Peninsula, um, 
it serves them very well. And so does the fact that now, as a result of that invasion, uh, more than a, a million Somalis are facing starvation. So should we should we attack al-shabaab militarily no it's a waste of our time they're ghosts we should get we should get as far from somalia as possible and we should do what and I, you know to divert but it's one of the most exciting things i've seen some of the people i write about in the book are somali doctors dr hal abdi and her two daughters uh, deco and amina and last weekend or yeah last two weekends ago I, I got to introduce them to Hillary Clinton because she has taken an active role now in supporting different groups that may have a more a, a better role in Somali society uh, that that is not a military role. Again, that NGO role, the State Department looking into what other groups will mean. Uh, and so that was pretty exciting. And so. There could be some movement, is, is what I'm saying, into other forms of engagement that does not mean U.S. boots on the ground. Very good. Uh, no, I wanted to uh, uh, kind of move a little bit to the Christian side of the fault line a little bit, and um, particularly in Africa, and in, including North Africa, but throughout Africa and indeed throughout Latin America, there's been a huge increase and rise of Pentecostalism in the past few years and, uh, well, the past two decades. Um, but uh, I, I just imagine and, and would expect that you came across uh, this in your, in your travels. Um, how do we, uh, what do we make of the Pentecostalist uh, uh, attraction of Pentecostalism and uh, its effect uh, in terms of uh, Christianity in Africa? Well, that's a good question. You know, I Pentecostalism has had a huge influence not only on Christianity, but also it, it, on Islam along the 10th parallel, which is a curious phenomenon. But, okay, so Pentecostalism being, you know, a spirit-based religion or a spirit-based belief that, you know, really allows the Holy Spirit to enter people, the human heart, right? Well, that's not so far from the Sufi understanding that that we encounter God through the human heart, right? Um, as well within Islam. So it's not so alien to African traditional believers who may, you know, worship the spirits of ancestors or or sky or land, um, because that idea of this this spirit graphs very easily onto traditional beliefs. So that's certainly one explanation for its explosive popularity, because one thing I didn't mention, that along the 10th parallel, both populations and uh, numbers of religious adherents, so religions are growing faster and populations are growing faster than anywhere else in the world, right? So that's certainly a factor that intensifies um, this encounter. So Pentecostalism, yes, I mean, You'd be hard pressed to, you know, throw a pebble in Nigeria and not hit not only a Pentecostal church but a Pentecostal person. I mean, they are everywhere. Uh, within Islam, there's an organization called Nasfat in Nigeria, which, if if you just shut your eyes and wandered into it, it's an Islamic group, 40 million members worldwide. You'd think you were in a Pentecostal church. Music, drums. They meet on Sunday, and their understanding is they're very much in competition for believers with the Pentecostals. And so in order to give that kind of feel-good feeling of church and music and street fair um, on Sunday, the Muslims have adopted the same day of worship and the same practices. So Pentecostalism has an extraordinarily powerful pull. And, you know, for me, because it's so different from the the form of Christianity in which I grew up, right, it, I would look a lot at, well, how does this gospel of prosperity work, right? Oh, boy, that, well, you're just saying, you know, belief makes you rich. Isn't that just all about money? And I had a wonderful Catholic priest in Nigeria say to me, um, Matthew Kuka said, you know, you may be able to insure your car, but we can't insure our car here. We have to rely on God. There is no insurance. Uh, and he was using that metaphor to explain how prosperity really works. The idea that, you know, belief in God makes you spiritually and financially rich and healthy all at once, how that really works so deeply in society. 
Yeah, very good. I hope that answered your question. Well, absolutely, and it really coincides with a lot of the uh, research. There's a sociologist, unfortunately, I can't remember his name just now, um, at, uh, from uh, University of Southern California, has done a great book on Pentecostalism in the developing world. And I, I remember one of the anecdotes in his book, which sort of juxtaposes the Catholic Mass in Brazil and the Pentecostal service happening around the corner, the one absolutely packed and lively, and, uh, and the other kind of two or three people sitting in, in, the, uh, in the cathedral. So it's a real um, sort of competition in a way uh, it, uh, of, uh, that Pentecostalism is providing to established uh, religions. I got sort of sure. one more substantive question, and then, and then there were some questions that came through about you. So um, the, the last sort of that, I don't want this to feel like a doctoral dissertation in an a examination or something for you, but um, one of the questions uh, from a member of our community, and this is a member of our community who deals a lot with humanitarian aid, asked about the importance and relevance of faith-based uh, and particularly Christian humanitarian uh, aid groups um, and, and in Southern Sudan, I'm sure you came across this as I did in South Sudan, which is the provision of humanitarian aid. At the same time, there's some pros proselytizing that occurs. And I just wondered about your reflections on this and, and um, particularly how, uh, the, the, what are the effects of faith-based organizations in providing humanitarian aid, um, and particularly uh, this question of linking aid with proselytizing proselytization, it's a big, big word. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's a very, very good question. And you know, I mean, the thing with faith-based groups is they're also extraordinarily very different, right? Just as, as secular aid groups would be. Um, you know, I would say one of, one of certainly the biggest and, and the, most, the, the most forward or the most cutting edge, to be quite frank, is Samaritan Purse, uh, Franklin Graham's organization. They have a medical piece and i have to be honest you know i've been in in uh, villages in eastern congo where hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced in the middle of the atori forest a place that until recently had no roads at all and many of those roads are logging roads right and so one of the things that happens is that rebels move down rebels move into traditional areas rebels really i mean ragtag bunch of militias raping and pillaging as they go and they use logging roads to get to places they've never been so it takes war places it's never been um and it takes aid workers places they've never been right here's globalization 101 and i have seen samaritan's purse on the ground um doing the finest and and most cutting edge relief work i've seen anywhere so that's certainly true i mean that is a blatantly faith-based organization um you know Another great one is World Vision. You know, they also in Eastern Congo. Now, there are certainly situations where, you know, I've seen or heard of isolated events where people are asked to make a decision for Christ, um, you know, in order to get some kind of aid. But possibly the best story I've ever heard about this would be I was in a in Khartoum on that trip with Franklin Graham um, in the north, right? Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. So somebody who converts to Christianity in northern Sudan, as you well know, um, faces death, not death really at, on behalf of the government, although in the letter of the law, you could be put to death for apostasy, much more by their family as a form of, of so because converting to Christianity from Islam would be a form of soiling the family honor, just as sex out of marriage, and so therefore legitimate honor killing, right? Okay, so that said, um, you know, I went, after Franklin Graham and a group of Christian, uh, a, gr a group that was with him had been in a particular hospital that was a children's hospital, it was totally Muslim in the North. I went the next day to talk back. I went back to talk to these people and I said, well, did it bother you? They handed you a book about Jesus. They said, not at all. The Muslims who come, they bring us blankets and they say the same thing. They just bring books about Islam. They said, it's only natural if somebody gives you something, they expect something in return. Um, so that's all anecdotal. There are certainly situations in which faith-based organizations have put, believe, put other aid workers in jeopardy by their work. Uh, but I would say that's the rare situation. And more often than not, the principal objective is getting the aid to the people, not trying to convert them. Yeah, very good, absolutely. Um, 
uh, well, I think one of your first uh, articles uh, as a journalist, is that, if I recall, and if you can believe what you read on the internet, um, was about <laughs> honor killings uh, in uh, in. You did your homework. Well, I tried. <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> no, I wanted That's to ask. That's exactly right. Yeah, very good. Um, well, uh, one of the questions uh, is, is more about um, about you as a person, and, and it's really about, um, you know, you've gone into what have to be the most dangerous places in the world, and uh, they're places that uh, my wife who's here won't let me go. Um, so I wonder what compels you, this is a question from one of our community members, you know, what compels you and, and other reporters to continually go into such dangerous places and personally threatening situations? Well, probably, a, a, there are probably answers, I'll be honest, there are probably reasons that I do some of the things I do that I'm not, that are not conscious, right? that I'm not terribly self-aware about. But, but in this case, there are, lot, there are lots of realities here. First of all, nine times out of 10, it's so much safer on the ground than it seems from far away. The glaring exception to that would be Somalia, uh, which is much more dangerous than, especially for reporters, which usually means local reporters. Um, and again, the thing that any good journalist knows is that, that the person who's truly at risk when we, when we put our lives in jeopardy by going somewhere is the local person who is taking us around because we fly out at the end of the day and they don't. So that, that for me has been the sharpest lesson um, that I've learned. You know, I was arrested by military intelligence um, after doing some reporting. Uh, it, I'm gonna leave that a little bit vague right now, but um, the person who was with me in this, in this context, you know, I was blindfolded, you know, handcuffed, gun to the head, but the person who was with me, who was a local person, was held in prison for six weeks. Um, so that always the local person is going to pay more. Um, you know, I, I have wrote this book because, because I'm super interested in borderlands. And honestly, I really feel like, you know, I hate the grandiosity of it, but, but somebody has to do it. And also I just really kind of feel like, oh, you know, as a daughter of a priest, but I feel like it's a calling. Um, now I'm working on American poverty in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Uh, the biggest danger here is that I'm going to overeat French fries in my courtyard Marriott after this talk. But, um, so really I try to do the work that I, that I feel is, is most essential at the moment. Good, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was actually going to ask you about your new project, and you mentioned you're doing a project on poverty in America. And well, what drove you to that topic, and, um, and, and, and what are you looking for? Well, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was in Nigeria. I, this is actually in the book, the, the little town I love in northern Nigeria called Wase. It's a tiny Islamic emirate. Uh, has one way in and out of town, and that's a bridge. And the bridge, one of the dynamics along the 10th parallel is that near the equator, uh, extreme weather events due to climate change are getting more and more extreme. Uh, so droughts getting more extreme, so are flash floods. Uh, this is part of, a, part of a weather pattern that actually drives the Atlantic coast, America's hurricane season. Um, anyway, so, Okay, so I was in Nigeria and this bridge collapsed and I had to reach this little town and in order to do so, th these young boys had to swim me, me across the river in an old oil barrel. And it, I was, it was right after the Minneapolis bridge had collapsed. And you know, I thought, I don't have to travel 6,000 miles to see a bridge collapse. There are enough bridges collapsing at home in, in the US. And, and I didn't feel anyone was adequately addressing in, in the way, in that kind of long form journalism, the America's crumbling infrastructure. So roads, wastewater, drinking water, uh, broadband, bridges. I'm now looking at the US's $2.2 trillion infrastructure deficit and what we're gonna do about it over the next five years. Very good. Uh, yeah, I would just point out uh, to the uh, audience that there's a very nice anecdote from your trip to Waze in the book about uh, visiting a palace uh, there of 
one of the local <laughs> imams, I think. So I, I uh, think that's a really nice uh, um, thing to look at. And certainly I would agree uh, with you that uh, the question of uh, poverty and endemic poverty is not something unique uh, to the 10th parallel or indeed uh, to simply to the developing world. And in fact, um, uh, most 75% uh, of the world's poor people who live under $2 a day uh, live in middle income countries. So it's a, it's wow. a stark statistic. I I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll, the, I'll email you the citation for that. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank good. you. That would be super helpful. <laughs> well, we have a last question, and, and uh, um, it's, uh, you're, you're a journalist and, and an author and an accomplished author of books, but you're also a poet. And so what are the, what's the linkage to poetry? And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, your work uh, as a poet as well. So, oh, this is one I don't get very often. People ask me about foreign policy, but not about poetry. So, so um, I'm a little, it's a little bit of a stutterer for me. Um, okay, so yes, I write poetry. And I guess what I would say is poetry and, and journalism. I probably learned to pay attention the way that I have to as a journalist by writing poetry. Um, that the, just looking at the world and paying extraordinarily careful attention to what's going on or trying to, it, which is really for me sort of the essence of poetry. And also to be honest, poetry is, oh boy, po poetry is spiritual. I mean, for me, that question of like ceremony, that that question Eliade frames about where is it that that sacred and secular space meet, you know, that sort of crossed uh, vertical and horizontal axis, that idea of hierophany. Um, for me, that's in poetry. I think that's probably what I took away from standing at the pulpit as a child was not so much the Bible, but the, the idea of it in, invoking um, some the, the power of something greater or so that's probably how poetry works. I'm finishing another book of poems, but it's way farther away. I go, I'm going on to Pakistan and then to Italy to, from Pittsburgh to go, to go write poems for a while. Well, I personally couldn't think of a better place uh, for inspiration than <laughs> Italy myself. Uh, so, uh, Eliza, um, we'd like to uh, really congratulate you again on, on the wonderful book, The Tenth Parallel, and, and I know there'll be a, a lot of interest in it here. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, um, well, you have an open invitation uh, from the Joseph oh. Corbell School of International Studies here at uh, DU to come. I think um, uh, Joseph Corbell, his uh, daughter, uh, Madeleine Albright also wrote a book on wow. religion and international affairs. Uh, and so we have an abiding interest in this topic here at the DU campus, uh, to be sure. And, and uh, just would uh, want to reiterate our open invitation for you to come visit here. So.